Well, tonight was especially important for uh, a number of candidates on the stage during the debate. One of them, Congresswoman uh, Tulsi, uh, Tulsi Gabbard, made it count. She became the top trending candidate on Google. Congresswoman uh, Gabbard joins me now. Thanks so much for, for being with us. How did you feel you. Uh, it went for you tonight? Uh, it, was, it was a good opportunity to have that platform to be able to address a lot of the major issues that we face. There's never quite enough time to right. get into these issues, uh, but nonetheless, I think we were able to cover a lot. Um, I want to play an exchange uh, you had with uh, Kamala Harris, sure. uh, which obviously got a huge amount of, uh, of attention. Let's watch. I want to bring the conversation back to the broken criminal justice system that is disproportionately negatively impacting black and brown people all across this country today. Now, Senator Harris says she's proud of her record as a prosecutor and that she'll be a prosecutor president, but I'm deeply concerned about this record. There are too many examples to cite, but she put over 1,500 people in jail for marijuana violations and then laughed about it when she was asked if she ever smoked marijuana. She blocked evidence. She blocked evidence that would have freed an innocent man from death row until the courts forced her to do so. She kept people in prison beyond their sentences to use them as cheap labor for the state of California. And she fought to keep cash you, bail system in place. That impacts poor people in the worst kind of way. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, Senator Harris, your response. As the elected attorney general of California, I did the work of significantly reforming the criminal justice system of a state of 40 million people, which became a national model for the work that needs to be done. And I am proud of that work. And I am proud of making a decision to not just give fancy speeches or be in a legislative body and give speeches on the floor, but actually doing the work of being in the position to use the power that I had to reform a system that is badly in need of reform. How did you feel that went? She never answered the question. She never addressed the issues that I brought up. And these are, these are examples that have been widely reported and documented. Uh, I think the people deserve answers, given she said tonight a few times how proud she is of her record. Yet there are too many people in California who have directly suffered, families who've been torn apart, people who have individually been harmed because of the decisions that she made as attorney general. Well, you, clearly, you, uh, your, you, your team had done re your research and had facts uh, down. Um, was your, your plan always to focus on her, or did you have other plans to focus on other people if the opportunities came up? No, I didn't, I didn't come into this with that kind of tactical strategy. Obviously, we're aware of the different positions that other candidates have taken, and given the opportunity discussing this incredibly important issue of criminal justice reform, one where now there is bipartisan support to actually bring about the kind of change that we need to see. Uh, people like Kamala Harris need to be held accountable for their record, not for something that she said or did 50 years ago. This is something that she did in her last job before she was elected as a U.S. Senator. In, in terms of, of health care, where are you on the spectrum of you know, We've been uh, hearing a lot about that. Yes, Medicare for all <laughs> yeah. or, or, you know, improve Obamacare. Yeah. Where are you? Well, first, let me just say our objective has to and must be making sure that no person, no American who is sick in this country should go without care because they can't afford it. That's why I have been and continue to be a supporter for Medicare for all that would guarantee that health care, that quality health care for every single American in this country. I also believe, like every other developed country in the world that has universal health care, that there is a role for private insurance to play for those who want it. Do you think for those who are embracing taking away private insurance from people ultimately, is that a, just strategically, politically, a, a, a non-starter? Uh, I, I don't know about the politics of it. I just think about it from the perspective of, of people, of the American people that if all of a sudden you are taking away their choice, that's not, that's not a very American thing in my opinion. I think our responsibility as leaders is to meet the challenge and address the problems that people are facing, that they are suffering because of big insurance and big pharma's influence over our healthcare system for so long, how they are profiting on the backs of sick people. So let's do our job, try to bring down the cost of healthcare in this country that's exorbitant, 
make sure people can get the quality care they need, and if they still choose that that's not what they want, they can go get the private insurance. Uh, I asked Kamala Harris about that exchange. She certainly seemed, I don't know, I guess surprised uh, that I think she was not expecting that from you. Uh, it, the only thing really she said about you is she said that you were essentially an apologist for Bashar al-Assad, uh, that you would never criticize him as a, uh, you know, a dictator or a murderer. I think it's unfortunate and a disservice to voters in this country that she resorts to cheap smears rather than actually addressing her record, the issues that I've raised, and the fact that she said she is proud of this record. If that's the case, then voters deserve to hear about why she's so proud of the lives that she has negatively impacted, the families that she's torn apart in California. If, uh, if voters are wondering, what is your take on Bashar al-Assad, what do you say? My take is one of a soldier, where I've seen the cost of war firsthand. In Iraq, serving in a medical unit every single day, confronted with that high human cost of war. So I will never apologize for doing all that I can to prevent more of my brothers and sisters from being sent into harm's way to fight counterproductive regime change wars that make our country less safe, that take more lives, and that cost taxpayers trillions more dollars. So if that means meeting with a dictator or meeting with an adversary, Absolutely. Do you, I would do it. Do you this consider is about the him, national security of yeah, our country. I understand that position. Do you consider him a, a torturer or a murderer? That's not what this is about. I don't defend or apologize or have anything to do with what he has done to But if you're president people. of the United States, it's fine if you want to meet with somebody, but uh, there's traditionally a role of a president of the United States calling out human rights abuses overseas. Bashar al-Assad sure. is head of a regime uh, which has disappeared many people as his Here, father. Here's, here's the way that I look at it, and the kind of leadership, the example of leadership that I follow is one where Kennedy met with and worked with Khrushchev to forge a deal that would keep the American people safe, where obviously Reagan met with Gorbachev, Roosevelt met with Stalin, worked with Stalin. Uh, you know, Nixon met with Mao. These are the kinds of leaders who think about things at a very practical and real level about how to keep our country right, and the but, American uh, people Stalin safe. Stalin killed, murdered 20 million people. That's was... my point exactly. Right. Yet Roosevelt not only met with him, but he allied with him right. to bring about an end to that war. But, but it, it, I'm sure you know Roosevelt would have acknowledged that Stalin murdered uh, millions of people. You don't want to. I, oh, I don't dispute that. Again, my focus. But you is, won't say anything about that about Bashar al-Assad. Bashar al I, I ha I've been very outspoken about this before. These are things that are being detract, being used as as detractions away from the central issue, which is we are still waging a regime change war in Syria today. We still have troops in Syria today, troops who are dying. That's my focus. That's why I'm running for president to bring about this sea change in our I understand the. I, I hadn't planned to go down this road, but I understand the not wanting to get involved militarily. Uh, and, and, and certainly, as a veteran, you uh, have more of a right than anybody to, to talk about that and have an opinion about it. Just, uh, uh, just on a factual basis, uh, Bashar al-Assad is a murderer and a torturer. Do you not agree with that? Do you, you, I don't dispute that. You don't dispute that. Okay. Um, you said something on the stage that really uh, I found very powerful, and I think. People who do not have a, uh, who have not served overseas, who do not have a loved one currently serving, who have served, understand. Uh, and and I, the word you used was betrayal. Yeah. Can you just talk to me a little bit about how that, where you see that, and how that motivates you? This is um, something that I've lived, and so many of my brothers and sisters in uniform have uh, suffered the consequences of leaders who have lied to us as an excuse to go and wage a regime change war to topple a dictator. It was very intentional. Over 4,000 of my brothers and sisters in uniform were killed as a result of that. So this is why I'm so serious and so focused about bringing about the kind of change to our foreign policy that will end these wasteful wars, that work to end this new Cold War and arms race, all of these things making our country less safe making the American people less safe, taking the lives of more of our service members, what to speak of the cost on the American people. Now, when I speak about betrayal, it's something that is continuing. We've seen it in Iraq and Libya and Syria, the cost and consequence of these continued regime change wars and how this president, and I mentioned this briefly before I ran out of time, is continuing this betrayal through his direct and indirect support of al-Qaeda in places like Syria. You know, Syria is uh, in, in the city of Idlib. It is the headquarters for al-Qaeda. Now, Trump is still trying to overthrow the regime of Assad, and 
and he has threatened anyone who goes after al-Qaeda in the city of Idlib, where they are in control of the whole city, then he will use our military to go against whoever attacks them there. This is a betrayal to me, every single service member, every single family who lost a loved one in the attacks on 9-11, every single American. But that, that does sound like, I mean, the, uh, you know, a talking point of the Assad regime. I mean, that, that, the Assad this, regime has said... This, this is just about the truth. I mean, Brett McGurk himself, who served under the Obama administration, and again under the Trump administration, he was been quoted saying that al-Qaeda is stronger than ever before and their stronghold is in Idlib. So why is Trump then making threats to anyone who threatens to go after them in Idlib that he will use our military to go after them? Mm. How do you explain that? Do How do you explain that to the 9-11 to the first responders, people who are still dealing with the after effects of that attack on 